Welcome back to the Driver's Room Podcast, and this is episode number three. So the first episode was with the boys, it was with uh, Sandy and the two Shawns. Second episode was with Jimmy McCray, and the third episode is with my father. He's not my actual real dad, by the way. Um, I just call him my father. It's Ali Shaw. Ali, we bring loads of different people, so obviously through our business, which is all perfect. So we've got people from motorsport, cars, agricultural, haulage. So no, everybody might not know who you are. So tell us a little bit about Ali Shaw. Who who is Ali? Who are you? I'm just a country boy. That's all I can say. <laughs> no, I originally come from a place, a place called the Cabaret, where nobody knows where it is. No, I was my second question was going to be where is that? Um, Eliza up between Rainy and Dufftown. Yeah, don't in, know those uh, two places either, but we'll move on. <laughs> and I uh, say so I grew up there and moved down to Perthshire in the late sixties. Um, just did my education down in Oxford, rather. Yeah. Perthshire. Left the school and I started off my career as a furniture and carpet salesman. No way. I did. Is I. That what you started as. That's what I started as. See, I've but always known there's been a bit of a salesman in you. To be uh, fair. And that was with the cooperative in Perth. Right. Okay. My wage was eight pound thirty four a week. Jeez. Oh. You were flashing the cash then. So I only ever knew you as do, being a police... Well, obviously, I know you through college. That's how we, me and you met. But I knew you were a police officer at one point in your, in I, your time. I was actually a special constable. With a started off in Tayside Police. Right. Then I moved, when I moved up to Aberdeenshire. Right. I joined the Grampian Police. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. And how, how, long, how long were you doing that for? Did it for 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so you were doing doing it for, for a short period of time, then moved on to doing what you're doing now, I suppose, is it? Um, when I was a special on? constable, it was like a, what you call it, a hobby, Bobby. <laughs> you did, did it at the weekends type of thing. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 the weekends and kind of caught up with all you drunks. Yeah. Was misbehaving. Yeah. No, me, I'm a well behaved boy. Uh, <laughs> so did you get your licenses and stuff through doing. Doing through the police? Did no, you, no, no, no. So um, did you get in the haulage then? What, what? I worked, I started in the haulage back in the early 70s. And uh, when I sat my heavy goods, my two weeks of school, and include my test, was £191. Mm -hmm. and I've still, there's a few boys that would wish they were paying that now. I bet you. Uh, and I've still got the receipt yet. You're kidding. No, I've still got it. Jesus. Oh. Right. So yeah. I was actually looking for it to bring it down today, but I couldn't, didn't have time to find it. But anyway, I so that was me. I started off in the haulage, and that was with a company in Medvin mm -hmm. in Perthshire, mm -hmm. by Fraser Hardy, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was the start of me and going into the haulage and been there ever since. Yeah. So obviously, the reason we've got you on the podcast is me, me and you met through, uh, you. We, we detailed your truck one time and then you've almost forcibly made me come to this thing called the Grampian Show. So I'm going to give you a wee bit of backstory to how... Our side went from, from meeting you, right? So we had obviously done car shows before. Yeah. So we had done uh, car shows and everything was going successful. And I always had an interest in doing agriculture stuff, right? But I could never see what the jump was for the business to do cars and to do, be doing modified cars to then all of a sudden moving into doing agriculture stuff. So to be honest, I just kind of put it to the back burner and thought that's not really going to be something that I'm going to do. When we initially started the business, we came up with a business plan and we looked at the commercial side of things and we said, to be honest, probably not. It's probably not a good, going into haulage industry. It's probably not a good industry for us to be looking at. Going into agriculture, it's probably not a good industry for us to be looking at. And then I met you and uh, we detailed the truck and you invited us to come up to, to Grampian. And I remember when you had left and we had sat, I said to them, I think this has got like maybe potential to do something because the market that we're in is really saturated. Yes, we do do things differently, but it is a really saturated market. This guy's inviting us up to go and do the structure. Nah, it's miles away. It's going to cost us a fortune. But it's up the way back end of Grampian somewhere. It's it's no it's no for us. I left that show thinking I was a millionaire. That was the difference in opinion that I had from from doing the car stuff to doing the holly stuff and. Like, you're the, uh, there's no beating about the bush, you're the sole reason that we moved into doing that industry because you were our introduction. Before you, we had never, we had never even looked at a okay. truck show. Um, it just really never, never had an interest in us. But then obviously you introduced us to Grampian and by far, every one of my staff say the exact same thing. It's our favourite show of the year. It's also the first one. So it's the one that 
the lulls went by and we're obviously <laughs> looking forward to getting back into show season then obviously we kick it off with Grampian we do have a small car event but we kick it off with Grampian which is a big event so that's how that's how I know you um, and through getting to know you you have some amount of stories some amount of stories to tell and you've you've, you've driven lorries all over the world I mean you're just about to go on a trip to to Iceland you were saying no to uh, uh, Lapland Lapland yeah yeah so and what you what you doing with that what's what's the Lapland trip so actually once again through the rally and yeah. um obviously been helping like a young lad from Bergauri Finley Retson in the rally this last year and, and obviously the higher Finley's car from RSC uh, Don Buckley Motorsport yeah. down in Kelso so um, since I retired, do do we be as a freelance driving? You're the most unretired person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other than that, my granddad, but never mind. Uh, they say Dom called me last uh, earlier on this week and asked me if uh, I could help him out, yeah. and uh, I said I could. Like so, the first one is taking one down to Lyon in France. Yeah. Then I fly home and I take the truck and the rally car up to. Uh, up this place in Finland, up top of Finland, yeah. So looking forward to it. Is, see, see now, is this like your? Is, is this the point where you're really enjoying the job? Yes, it is. Uh, I mean, it's maybe a wrong thing to say, but I can work when when I want to and yeah. who I want to for, and yeah. it's great. Uh, you know, I would, it's not the same thing over and over again. You're doing very different things. Oh from, yeah, a massive from, variety of things. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So obviously, we were just talking about the Grand Prix show there. So that is. That's where I got to know you, but your show season career almost started a way, way back because I think you were telling me you were one of the first when it came to the sort of truck shows and doing cleaning and almost like detailing and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, but, um, the very first truck show was here in Scotland um, back in 1986. I won it with my, my daft from VG Mathers in Aberdeen. And that was the last time my daft won a truck show. Uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> and... Uh, and I competed obviously in truck shows throughout the eighties and the yeah. early nineties. Then I kind of went away from it for a while. Then when I moved, um, no, I still stayed up north. I started the Grampian Truck Show at the Grampian Transport Museum in Afford. Right. A very small show, right in the middle of nowhere as well. Yeah, but it was a good little show. Mm-hmm. Always a great entry, people. Always plenty to happen at it. So it ran for four years. Mm-hmm before I moved down to central Scotland here. And then back one, two, three, three years, four years ago, mm-hmm. I was at a, a show blast from the past at Thainston. Mm-hmm. And my son, Ali, came along to the show and he says to me, Dad, this would be a good place for a truck show. <laughs> and that's when it started. Ali and you got our heads together. And then we got the two Derek's involved, Derek Mitchell and Derek Ross. And, and they... What we would say about the Grampian Truck Show is it's probably drivers running a show for yeah, drivers. And you can tell that straight away. You know, and, and I think that's a good thing about the show. I think the atmosphere is always quite good at the show mm-hmm. and we'd always like to keep keep that atmosphere at the show. And it, it is out in the, like, it's not out in the middle of nowhere, but it's, it's not in a very popular location, but the amount of people that you get coming from all over Europe, everything just yeah. just coming to the show is. What, what's the stresses like running the show? Like, is organising it? Is it? It's a. Uh, it's not too bad no. to be fair. Mm-hmm. I mean, Alistair, my young son now, he's taking more to do with it, yeah. the administration side of it, and he yeah. does really well with that side of it, which is fantastic for me because yeah. it took a lot of pressure off of me, yeah. Callum. But to uh, see the guy last week, Alistair put the the entry form on live mm-hmm. last Friday night, whatever it was. Yeah. And within four hours, there were 87 people booked in and paid. Just shows you that. Yeah. Just shows you. And so we, when was that first truck show that you done then? When was that? 2006. Sorry, 2003. The first, no, not sorry, not uh, Grand Pain, as in the first truck show you actually competed in. Oh, when, nine, which you won? 1986. 1986. So you must have seen the biggest change when it came to truck shows, the likes of your truck face and signees and all, all that sort of stuff. You must have seen one big change from when it came from there to, to what we're getting for truck shows now. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that the, the, the one of the big shows that takes place over Great Britain, 
Det er så det, fast, det så er det ikke, vi kan se. Svejt. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the sport really... Yeah. Yes, I'm surprised that they get the end to do. Yeah. Because it's a massive money-making exercise yeah. for them. Yeah. And I think they've spoiled it for a lot of people. Yeah. Do you think they've maybe just commercialised it? Far too much. Do you think so? I mean, I've not been to Ingolstadt now <sighs> since 2016. Yeah. It was the last time I was at Ingolstadt. Aye, obviously, Matt... Matt my perception on it's a wee bit different because I'm obviously coming from a business point of view. So it's got footfall, and that's what I'm interested in. And the way they organise the show for the, for me as a business is great. Like, but I can understand maybe how you, you obviously run Grampian. It's very very different, and that's how it's, it's very much a drivers sort of show, which I suppose is what it really should be, um, considering that that's who's going to attend. Yeah, that's um, right. But sometimes. Some of the bigger events, maybe not necessarily, but some of the bigger events do. There's one that we went to, a uh, convoy in the park, and it was not designed for businesses to be there, and it was not designed for even really the truck drivers to be there. Although that that's what the show is like. Yeah. The the guys didn't know when they were getting judged. The guys didn't know what to part. It was a bit of a riot. Um, but things like the smaller shows I definitely do enjoy that they're a lot more kind of intimate and you can you get access to people that you maybe necessarily wouldn't normally get access to um, as well so Grampian's running this year so you can drop a wee plug in here Ali so when when is the Grampian show this the year? The Grampian show this year will be the 27th 28th of April at the Thainston Agricultural Centre in Varuri don't miss it it's going to be a great show plenty for all the family to come along plenty for the kids see you there Are we doing the mini truck show this year? Of course, yeah, yeah definitely. That that was, I hadn't seen that until you had done it, and I'm not saying that you did start it, but then I've seen so many other shows add it on to the end of like the the shows now, and now it's like became a thing. Yeah, but I had never ever seen that until it was done at Grampian before, like doing the parade and all that sort of stuff with the mini truckers, which was quite cool. You done it at Knock Hill as well, which was yeah, which was pretty successful. Um, so. I want to talk a wee bit more about your driving, and one of the reasons I've got you in, in the podcast is I spoke to I spoke to Sean on that about this, and this is what people are when we've put the poll out to see what people want us to talk to you about. It's about the big changes that have came in your industry from when you were starting out to guys now trying to start out because the jobs became very Gucci in a sense. Like TikTok and Instagram have made a big change to that. Like some of these guys who if I can just be honest, are just like, not just truck drivers, but they're truck drivers, but they have almost came became like celebrities. That wouldn't really have been a thing when you were no when you were no. growing up. I think the social media has maybe had some good points for the industry, mm-hmm. but to be fair, it's got made a lot of bad points for the industry as well. Yeah, and I think now a lot of the youngsters can. A lot of youngsters obviously don't want to come in and do the job no. because they're away from home yeah. and probably it's not a clean job. Or some of it's not a clean job to do. Um, You've told me some stories about services that you went into. But. <laughs> oh, I mean, the facilities in Great Britain now for the, the drivers is atrocious. Yeah. And, I mean, there was one, a big one in, in, down in uh, Manchester. I closed down there last week or the week mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. It was practically called Lim, the popular truck stop. Yeah. And it was taken over by Moto. Yeah. And it went downhill just rapidly after that. Yeah. And the place was disgusting. Aye. The facilities are meant to wash and showers and that. I wouldn't use them. You wouldn't use them at all. No. no. no, no. So do, do you think then that, that social media, do you think that that's got a part to play in how the industry is struggling for drivers to, to get new drivers through the door? Do you think that that's got a problem with it? Like, because... Mm. One of the things that I'm seeing is if I look at all the training schools and stuff, whoever it might be, they seem to be getting plenty of people through the door. And if you phone and you ask up, because I'm trying to get through my, my classes now just because in the future we want to do something we're all perfect, but they, they're, they're so booked up, but then they're constantly looking for drivers. So there feels like the need's been met through the recruitment, but then it doesn't seem as if these guys are sticking to the job. And I don't know if I ah, Sandy and Sean... Specifically, do you think you guys are like partly responsible for like kind of 
Gucci in the job up a wee bit, like glorifying it, and then people get in at the job and they realise, oh wait a minute, I'm at home on my like I'm out in the truck on my own. I'm not at home. I'm missing all these things with family. Your your pals are going out on a Friday night, and you're still trying to get back up the road for down south or coming off a boat or whatever. So do you think that that's social media's got the part to play in that? That definitely, yeah. And you know when you start as well, the money, the, the job now is. I mean, de- the bottom line I think is the government, mm-hmm. um, the structure for the road transport industry, the authorities, the enforcement of it. It's, there's nothing attractive about the job now. No. You know, and I mean, I remember when I first started driving lorry, I mean, didn't have sleeper cabs, mm. you didn't have talk liners. No. We, everything was held down with ropes and sheets. <laughs> you know, and we used to get in the railway wagons in Perth, unload by hand 200 weight bags. Sugar beet, pa- big paper bags up the railway carriages, mm-hmm. put them on the, the leaf of trucks, and did the same with Campbell soups out the railway wagons at the station at Law, mm-hmm. Law Junction up there. We used to, yeah. uh, and I mean, guys wouldn't do these things now. No. You'd hand build them off the wagon, on your truck, sheet it all, then go and start doing all your shop deliveries with the soup. Yeah. Uh, people wouldn't do that now. No. And uh, they, don't want a, they don't want a relationship with customers and all that sort of stuff now they very much want to stay in their own cab and do, do their own sort of things but i i just feel like when i spoke to them i says i think you boys have maybe got a wee part to play in one of your industry's problems but they they didn't think that they did which was obvious because they use social media but i, I don't know um european work was a big thing that people have asked me to ask you about because right. there's a lot of truck drivers who, obviously you know we are quite big in the haulage industry now yes there is a lot of boys that have maybe now been driving in the UK for like two, three years and they're now wanting to make that switch from driving in the UK to get to European work. You, you've done European work before, I'm going to assume, just a couple of times. I've done a, been a, a few times, <laughs> yeah. What's your most interesting journey you've done in Europe? Um, well, there's many, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I treat every journey the same mm-hmm. because um, it doesn't matter where you're going, you're, you're very seldom you go to the same place twice. Yeah. You know, so probably when we used to run over to the, the and into Romania, to the, the Constantine in Romania, it was a, you seen a different way of people's lives then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, going through Hungary was was good. Then when you, from Hungary into Romania, you seen a, a massive difference in the way people's lives were there. And, yeah. It was a different culture shock, really, to uh, see. Do you, have, do you have, like, one of the big things that I, I kind of see is for some reason when you, some not all of them, obviously, but sometimes when you step into these European countries, the security of yourself and your load and your lorry becomes one of the biggest fears. And that's one of the questions that the guys have asked is, like, they're worried about, if they are going to places like uh, Romania, or whatever, like, did you did you find it inti- like intimidating, or were you were you scared, or whatever? Is there truck stops for these guys to be pulling in it that are normal, or are they off at the side <coughs> of the road? Is it just the same as driving over here? That's what these guys are wanting to know. Some of the, the truck stops in Europe are fantastic. Yeah, I mean Germany, the Otterhofs, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, um, your kit for well, the same in Holland, mm-hmm. um, even. In Hungary, I mean, we always used to stop at one place um, before Budapest, uh, mm-hmm. Biscay, mm-hmm. and uh, it didn't look nothing fancy, but yeah. the food was good. I remember, but still, it was still the same. Yeah, the, the showers, you can in a corrugated tin shed yeah. attached to the, the cafe with the showers, but they're great. Yeah. They're clean. Yeah. And uh, no, they're good. But the facilities abroad are always better. Aye. Security, you're no secure nowhere nowadays. No, I know. You know, it's um, certainly in, in Germany, the Otterhofs, usually there is somebody on patrol all night. Yeah. Some places here in this country have got patrol Patrols. all night, yeah. but they still get their cut and slashed right. as well. Yeah. Um, I was never, I've never been one for parking. I you never parked. You ever had any really sketchy situations when you've been parked up where somebody's tried to rob you or, or anything like that? You ever been faced with those situations? The only time I've ever been uh, done was in Italy. Mm. Um, I, and I still think to this day it was two Czech Republic drivers that was parked next to me. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I rose across to the services at, uh, at Pescara 
to Thailand to come back. And these two young guys are walking about out this Volvo with laptops in their hand. Mm-hmm. And we carried, we, I mean, our boss supplied us with locks for the doors for the inside, mm-hmm. but I'd never put it back on. Mm-hmm. And uh, all my clothes were always folded up, laid on top of the ceiling wheel. And uh, I, woke, I woke up yeah, at three o'clock in the morning feeling cold. And I could just see the curtains moving with the wind. And I noticed my trousers and that were on the floor of my lorry. And uh, it was my own fault. I never put this lock back on inside. Uh, and what they'd done, I think, they'd used something like a, a football cut in half yeah, okay. and put it over the locker door and hut it and released the lock of the, the Scania door. Uh, okay. And uh, they stole my wallet, my car, my phone. And... Uh, did they see what was the load? Did they, did no, no, they never touched. It was an, an empty flat trailer on, so... Ah, okay. Because um, at that time, we were doing like a regular workout of Artona okay. every week back for Aberdeen. Yeah. So, no, that was my, that's my worst experience ever. Yeah. I had, um, had a, five, six weeks ago, had two immigrants came in through the roof of my trailer in France. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the that's one of the questions that we've been asked is, I know a lot of boys that run in and out of France quite a lot, and that seems to be a big fear of them because they're terrified that if they start taking on this work, is how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that situation? Uh, as in a PC way as possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the, I mean, the government, I mean, there is a procedure now. Right, okay. Uh, most college companies now, they've got a forum which you complete throughout the duration of your journey. Yeah. Where it started, your checkpoints, where you right, stopped. Okay. Like in this instance, for myself, um, I changed over with another driver at a place called Summer Seuss in France. No, somebody Seuss, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and uh, I came up the road and I parked overnight. It was fine. And the next day I stopped at the garage for fuel. And uh, away I went. Uh, I stopped for a refreshment break, just maybe half an hour up the road. And I just parked at the fuel pumps. And I knew from previous experience that from like a Reims North, it was always a dodgy area for, for clandestines. Yeah. So I'm walking across to the services and kept looking back because there was hedges along the other side of the road. Yeah. And I walked into the forecourt and I just turned around and I could see the two guys running up the ladder at the front of the trailer, uh. long roof, slash the roof, and the trailer. So I shouted to the lady at the forecourt called the gendarmerie, which he did. They were there within minutes, and she was good. The two mm-hmm. yeah. men, two gentlemen, came out the back of the trailer, and the, the police apprehended one of them. The other yeah. one got away. Aye. But no, go back there the next day and do the same again. I know. It must be terrifying as a driver, especially a new driver. You can understand their fear with that situation and ha- happening to them. Do you know what I mean? And what that... Just what that procedure is that you actually go through, that's... Well, the, the first thing that's through my mind is, the guy's got a knife because he slashed the roof open. Well, exactly. So he uh, didn't so didn't try nothing with him. Because no. he, he wouldn't think twice of taking a knife to you. No, no. And no matter what the load is, any situation that's going on, your job's not worth no. your life. Do you no, know what I mean? Definitely not. No. Definitely not. So one of the things that, uh, that you've done when you retired is uh, you've taken on a role, I don't know if it's maybe just Stuart Nicol transport, but you've taken on a role where you're like educating drivers and stuff as well. So again, that's the other reason why we got you on the podcast because that's something that you've been doing recently and why we're asking you these questions. I was doing the uh, driving assessments, yeah, yeah, for some of Stuart's uh, local drivers yeah. and uh, enjoy doing it. But yeah, and uh, I, like, I like doing that type of thing. Yeah. What's, um, you told me a story, I think this must have been about a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted you to tell it on the podcast, and it's been racking my... That's the one of the notes that I had taken on my phone. Um, about someone who had been... Was it knocked down by a lorry and was terrified by a lorry? And then yeah. I want you to tell this story, because this was brilliant. It's, it was a gentleman from Ayrshire, Colin Duffy. Um, what it was, myself and John Templeton were lorries and display at Kames Race Circuit. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I think it was a, a show, a motor show they done up there at Kames. And anyway, I was standing speaking to um, by Stuart Payton later on the day and seeing the guy come across to my truck in the wheelchair. Mm. I'd never seen a gentleman in my life before. Mm. And he just came over to the wheelchair and he, he the passenger side and he put his hands over the wheel. Just like a... How would you... Take like an arch. Kind of hoist himself up. Yeah, and, and, and just put his head against the wheel. Yeah. And he was there for two, three minutes. And yeah. And I went across and 
spoke to the gentleman, he told me who he was, and then he told me the story. Um, it was a mind-blowing emotional. Yeah, yeah. But tell us, let us know. <laughs> um, <laughs> My goal, by the way, was to make Ali cry in this podcast. Uh, no, just, <laughs> just the fact that came at yeah. him and he'd been run over by a lorry yeah. uh, way back during the, the coal miner strike yeah. down at the roundabout at Kilmarnock. Mm-hmm. And he uh, went underneath the lorry at the front, mm-hmm. driver's side, mm-hmm. and they came out behind the passenger wheels, the unit, the other side, the yes. near side. And uh, he was still conscious. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was actually not realised at the time we'd actually lost one of his li- uh, limbs. Right, okay. And uh, and then the reality kind of hit what had happened. The pavilion, the pavilion passenger was on the, the the bike. He wasn't quite so bad. Right, okay. But Colin had certainly got in a severe injuries and ended up being in the hospital a long, long time. I think it was over a year in hospital. Wow. Um, but no, and Colin would be quite happy. He would tell you the whole story in a yeah. podcast if you wanted to, yeah. and because he, it's really, really good. And then you, he hadn't been near a worry until that moment. That no, was... that's right. And uh, I opened the door and that, and he was very emotional. Mm-hmm. And uh, I seized him. I said, get your ass out of that wheelchair. And got me in that lorry. Mm-hmm. And he did. He one le- it was obviously still one limb. He, he climbed up, hopped up into the passenger seat of the lorry, and, and uh, I was, was happy, and, and this was his fear of lorries kind of kind disappearing uh, after 37 years. Yeah. And uh, so we came down and we're speaking away, and I seized him. I said, I'm going to take you a step further, Colin. Mm-hmm. He says, How do you mean? I said, I'm going to get you to drive my lorry one day. Mm-hmm. And I did. Excellent. Excellent. That's it's all those sort of things is is to why I got on with you so well is because you you're a true gentleman. The fact that when you've retired, they're using that time to almost get like give back to the industry. One obviously doing the podcast. Yeah. Two, you're doing driver training. I know I see you on social media or whatever it is, constantly <coughs> giving guys encouragement or like not not information, but you're you're almost giving them pointers and like guiding people as to as to how to do that and very popular man for that reason as well. I think Did you, you have somebody that done that for you? Or did you have to kinda of just do it on your own or? No, probably one of the reasons why I do it so often is all my time I'm driving I still this very day, I never have a radio on mm. driving. Car, lorry, never. Really? I, no never. I constantly my driving all the time. Well, I can do that. I don't think I can do that. That's yeah, crazy. I, I mean, even I, my, my wife will tell you the same. Um, if I'm in the car, it is not on. We can be here, drive from here, land into Johnny Groats, never be radio on. Wow. Just total concentration, concentration in yeah. what you're doing. So, back to onto the European point, right? Because we get asked this quite a bit. What would be your like kind of top two points that you were to give to drivers that have maybe. Had a couple of years experience just driving here in the UK and now want to move into doing that European work. What's your what's your big tip for them? First thing I would say is be sure is that's just what you want to do. Mm. Uh, because once you cross the the English Channel, you're into the unknown yep. because people's languages, uh, sometimes different countries, people can speak English, but they won't speak English. Yeah. And they make it difficult for you. Yeah. Um, the driving in the roads is a lot better, better roads, obviously, than we have here. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, it's everybody should try it. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't speak about a job if you've not done it. Aye. And uh, I mean, you can try it if you don't like it, Aye. go back to do whatever you want to do best. Yeah, but people, I'd, I'd always encourage people to try it, just try it. Yeah, definitely. What do you think? the... Obviously, every industry has a pinnacle, like almost like job role, right? So some people might see it as like European work, but in the haulage industry, what's like this sort of dream job you can get in that industry? Whether it be the type of loads you're shifting, whatever it might be, what's what's the what's the dream targets that people are trying to get the goals? A lot of people will disagree with me here, mm-hmm. but nowadays because the manufacturers are making the truck so high standard. Mm-hmm. Most people want to drive a big fancy Scania or a big yeah. fancy truck of any kind. Yeah. But okay, the work to go with it sometimes is no 
what it sounds to be. Yeah. It's more, okay, you've got to bring the two together and, okay, all right, I've got a driver's lorry, but I've got work to do at the same time, Aye. you know. Or the, the gear and no idea. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, with the, the driver standards agency now, when they're teaching people to drive cars mm. and lorries, they do not emphasize enough on the, the driving properly now. Yeah. Again, the people's given a license now. They're not even taught the reverse in their test now. Yeah. And uh, they're not taught how to work tachographs. Well, let's talk about that, right? So see see, see the driving for, for guys wanting to get into your industry now. What what's, what sort of things can they expect to get in their tests? What what sort of things, do, what happens? Well, you obviously, think the test, you've got your theory test, mm-hmm. your, uh, your practical and... I think they still do the hazard perception with the, yeah. the heavy goods. Yeah. But once you're doing your lessons, you don't, like when I start my test, you're reversing I, out in industrial state maybe somewhere. Yeah, okay. Or, or a wee bit of testing yeah. station. Mm-hmm. They don't get that now. It's not included in the test now. Because I remember Sean Thompson telling me the first time he had reversed onto a bay was the day he'd done the first job. So like he had never reversed onto a bay no. in his life or any... Anything that even resembled that sort of manoeuvre or whatever, like in his test, which when you're in charge of something that can potentially have 44 tons in it, is yeah. a bit, it's a bit a daunting fact that you've never reversed it on yeah. your bear. And before. you see it, I mean, before I give up driving, if okay in the car transport, it didn't see quite so much, but there's lots of times you go to places more like RDC centres mm-hmm. and people can't reverse on the base. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing the driver assessments, um, was one of the first guys I was out with, we went to Tesco at Livingston, mm-hmm. and he uh, was given the, the bay to go on to, and driven between two parked lorries, mm-hmm. and he's panicking and flustered. I said, look, chill out, be fine. I said, I'll jump out. Just let me, listen to what I'm telling you, you're going to be in the bother. Mm-hmm. And he did. Won the bay at the one or first time. Just listen to what I was telling him to do. Yeah. And, he was like a sigh of relief, Aye. but now he's managing fine. Aye. Just, you know, you. just patient, just give yourself plenty of time. And it's always worse, obviously, when there's people standing watching you. Aye. You know, yeah. that, that puts a lot of people off. I too. can't really comment on anything. I've, I'm, I'm, I've dumped my van out there, but that's also because I was running late. But, no, <laughs> but, no, and, I mean. uh, but I also think when people get taught to drive the trucks, before they get out on the road, they should all get a section and how to use the datagraph, yeah. the driver's hours regulations, yeah. and I think there should be a section on load securing yeah. as well. Aye. I mean, it's unfair, people pass their test, they could go way down the road there with a, a load of timber and a top liner, mm. which is totally not strapped in properly, and it might end up coming through the curtain, Aye. because they don't know any better. No. Again, people say, it's just above the seat, the company now, Aye. there's a keys of lorry, on you go. Aye. There's not near enough emphasis on the load securing on the actual the, job itself no and definitely not no and I think there's something the government really needs to work on mm. instead of some of the things they're coming up with yeah yeah. what's um, what's, what's your favourite load what's been the favourite thing that you've shifted or favourite job that you've had the best load ever I've shifted was moving all Collins cars yeah do not kill yeah aye, aye. Mm. That, that you're, you're quite um Quite big into motorsport as well. You've been, we, we spoke about him right at the very start, but Finley mm-hmm. Retson, you've been doing a wee bit of doing a wee bit of work with him. You're obviously quite close with uh, Jimmy. How did that all come about, by the way? Um, see, from years ago, mm-hmm. my father bought a, a Vauxhall Viva from SMT at Perth. Right. Okay. Exactly the same time as Jimmy came on board with Vauxhall. Right. Okay. And the gentleman that Jimmy was speaking about was Walter Gray. Mm-hmm. He was the dealer principal. Mm-hmm. At SMT at Perth, mm-hmm. and uh, also Alex D, who turned out to be the mechanic for the Vauxhall dealer team, Vauxhall team, and the Opel team with with Jimmy right, okay. uh, for years, and still keep in touch with Alex as well yet to this very day. So, how did you get involved with Jimmy then? How did you? Hey, it's been a legend of mine for years. Uh, really has been. I mean, a lot of people say the same back in the day. Jimmy McCree was the best early driver out there. Aye. And because his sons followed suit, mm-hmm. um, the McCree family and name and rallying has been a fantastic inspiration for others to 
join rallying or do yeah. rallying in Scotland yeah. and over all over the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's what we were talking about earlier. Like he's a household name. It's somebody without a doubt. It's like Schumacher. Yeah. It's like just one of those names. Like it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Like somebody, somebody knows that name. And even weird conversation, but I think it was about two years ago. I was in Tenerife. And <coughs> the boy asked what it was that I had done as a business, and I was telling him cars and we doing motorsport. And he's like, "Oh, Colin McRae." And I'm like, "Guy's from Tenerife, and he's here talking about Colin McRae." Do you know what I mean? It's a uh, Aye, it's, it's a household name, but we'll do a wee bit of plugging on Finley, right? Right, We've definitely. done a wee bit of sponsoring with Finley as well, and you do a lot of work for him. Um, so tell us tell us a wee bit about Finley. We're going to get Finley on the podcast in the next couple of weeks as well. So Good, fantastic. T- tell us about him. Um, well, I started following Finley when he did the juniors, mm-hmm. when he was rallying between 14 and 17. Mm-hmm. And he was very good, mm-hmm. and I always say to myself, that lad is good, that yeah. lad can go places. Yeah. And he... Uh, he went into the Fiesta ST Challenge, which he was very, very good at as well. Then, just about then, the COVID came in to go. So, was nothing happened. And then, not last year, the year before, it was actually the McRae Challenge. Aye. Um, Finley was uh, taking part in it. And I was navigating for Barry Groundwater at the time, mm-hmm. at the rally. And... Uh, God, it was good. Like it was the style that was of the first time he'd ever sat in that car as well. It was, it? yeah. Aye. And uh, oh, his times was phenomenal. Like Aye, he was against stages, so. yeah. Aye. And then so okay, I just let it blew away in the back, the yeah. back boiler. Yeah. And then uh, in November the fifth, the night the guy, the guy Fox at Knock Hill, he did the rally at Creel, mm-hmm. and he won it. Mm-hmm. And that was the same time the Fiesta as well. Yeah. And uh, I think like, that lad has got so much potential. Yeah. I'd like to see him do go further. Yeah. And actually, I was my I spoke, I spoke to his dad, mm-hmm. Dave, and uh, we had a good chat on the phone. And I went and met Dave, and we sat down and spoke about it. And we decided that the Scottish Championship last year was we're trying to get a package put together mm-hmm. for that. Like so, yeah. we got our heads together and managed to up with some sponsorship for them to do the Scottish champion. Yeah. The Scottish Championship. Yeah. I can take some of Um so um he's he's somebody he's somebody who's very who's very likable as well. Like him and his dad are they're, they're genuine guys as the well, do you know what I mean? A lovely they're family. Dead, really they're, are. Dead easy to get on with. And I have a I have a plan that I want to speak to Dave about for this for the end of this year. Um for doing a wee bit of sponsorship. But I'm I'm definitely not saying it on a podcast. But it's something that I think oh people will stand back and go I can't believe that they've <coughs> I can't believe that they've actually done that. So yeah. Ali, what's what's the plans? What's the plans with you now? Obviously, you're in kind of semi retirement, but you're absolutely not retired even in the slightest. No. What's um you've got that road trip coming up, and you've just back from France doing another car. Have you got any other interesting jobs like that coming up? Um, no, really at the yeah. moment, no. I just just started actually put the proposal together for Finley mm-hmm. for this year. So this year, Aye. started doing it yesterday. Yeah. So hopefully, like try and get some people on board. Come and ask me for money again. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, no, so going back to that a wee bit, just mm-hmm. when he came out last year, mm-hmm. he had a, a good result in the snowman. Yeah. And he went on to the space space stages and he won it. Yeah. And uh, I think it okay to unsuccessful maybe in a couple other events, but he still, when he finished the, the rallies, he, he was always in the top four, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I, it's yeah, it's it was a big learning curve for him last uh-huh. year, and I think it'll be a lot better this year. Well, that's it. Like it was his it was his first full attempt at yeah. doing it, so he's gonna yeah. obviously it's not, you just let us know that snowman's just been cancelled. Yeah, um, unfortunately. So he's gonna he's he's still gonna get another full crack at it. Plus, I've got something that I would like him to get involved in, which I think he's I think he's pretty keen on. Um, I just need to make sure I sell a lot of bottles of quite detail before the, before we do it. <laughs> before yeah. we do it, but um, I want you to give us. Give us one tip to somebody who is just wanting to get into the industry. One thing that you that you would tell them that is a must know for them getting into the industry this day and age. Wow. I know I've put you on the spot now. You did I? put me on the spot. Just oh god, I had to 
it could be so many things, but a one thing to do, you've got to love what you do. Immerse yourself in it. Yeah. Aye. Again, it's a lonely life. Mm -hmm. You know, you can a lot of time you're out of your way for two, three days on your own. Yeah. Some guys love it. Yeah. Some people can't do it. Yeah. You know, and they... Uh, I feel like I get on the bother. I like my own space, and yeah. um, no, it's it's a lonely life, and just immerse yourself in the job, basically. Yeah, aye. that's right. Aye. If you if you immerse yourself in the job, do what you're meant to do, and do it properly, you 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 go far. Yeah, don't focus on the TikTokers. And no, the rest. just do no. The job. Social media does a lot of harm. Aye. It does. Aye. Well, Ali. Thank you very much for yeah. joining us on the podcast. I don't think this is going to be the last time we're going to get you on here. I definitely think that you've got some some more stories, <laughs> some more stories to tell. I'll get the bus down the next time to get a bottle of whiskey with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I definitely think you've got more stories to tell. But the big thing is, when we put the polls out, people were dead interested because we have a lot of younger people that are watching us who are wanting to get into the industry, and I just didn't think there was anybody better to bring in and and kind of. Give them the insight as to what the job might be, what they should do, and hopefully tell us a couple of stories in, in the meantime. Okay. Good man. Ali, thank you very much. Guys, you're make welcome. Sure if you are uh, watching or you're listening to this podcast, you like, you follow, you comment, and you share it to as many people as you possibly can. We'll catch you next week on episode number four.